as my health started to become more important to his practice, as his practice grew, he approached me and he said, why don't we put all the oars in the same boat and work together to build an even bigger practice, a better business, and be able to help more people find their own financial dreams. Hi, I'm Deirdre Breckenridge. I've spent my entire career helping women to get unstuck, to share their stories, nurture relationships, and to grow their brands. But most of all, to find their voices so they can make a difference. Women Worldwide features the stories of passionate women and the ups and downs of their journeys. With deep insight and advice, let Women Worldwide ignite your passion so you can excel in life. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Women Worldwide. Wherever you are in this world, thank you for tuning in, for sharing, and for letting us know how much you are enjoying the stories of the experts who come on this show. You're also letting us know that when you tune in, you are tapping into their advice and actionable tips. And we love this because with all of these guests, they're so accomplished. They have highs, but they also have their lows and their challenges. And we love knowing that it's helping you to get through some of your obstacles and to tackle those obstacles, feel your passion and to power up your own voice. So let's keep this party going because we are changing lives one story at a time. All right, let's get to today's topic and guest. The topic is real relationships. Now you're probably thinking, well, what's the difference between a real relationship and one that's not real? How do you have a relationship if it's not real? Well, the difference is there are relationships that are connections, transactions, and they're on the surface. And then the real relationships are based on the deep knowledge, the loyalty, and the trust, and the advocacy you build. So we're gonna dive into this topic. I'm so glad that today, joining me on the show is Trisha O'Malley. She is the Director of Client Relations and Marketing at Northwestern Mutual, and she has extensive knowledge in relationship building, philanthropy, donor relations, and she uses her skills in marketing also to be able to create better experiences and service. Now I could go on and on about Trisha, but I think it's best that she shares her story with you. Trisha, it's great to have you on my show. Welcome. Thank you, Deidre. I'm so excited to be here and what an appropriate topic. I've got oh. lots of relationships. <laughs> I know you do. That's why you're the perfect guest and you also know how much I believe in real relationships mm -hmm. and have been using this as a, a basis of study. And before we dive into what makes a great relationship and what are the steps that we can take, and I think maybe you could just kick it off with how did you get to a point of being a director of client relations and marketing at Northwestern Mutual? Sure. Well, I think like a lot of other women, my career path has not been a ladder. It hasn't been the traditional climb the rung ladder. Um, probably looks a little bit more like a monkey bar, frankly. <laughs> um, I spent about 26 years in nonprofit, in philanthropy, mostly in the healthcare sector. Um, got a master's degree in healthcare administration, an advanced degree in healthcare leadership, and was really very vested in helping hospitals raise funds, significant funds. Um, in that role, I spent a lot of time being a conduit between donors and hospital administrators and caregivers or providers, which really led me to where I am today. Um, one of those monkey bar things <laughs> I did is um, I had been helping my significant other a little bit with his practice. He's a financial planner at Northwestern Mutual. Wow, and as that connection. help, as my help started to become more important to his practice, as his practice grew, he approached me and he said, why don't we put all the oars in the same boat and work together to build an even bigger practice, a better business, and be able to help more people find their own financial dreams. Um, that excited me. That really excited me. So not only am I using some of my skills, but I get to work with my partner sometimes. 
That is awesome. So I, yeah. I love the, the monkey bar. <laughs> yeah. The monkey bars that you use. And the fact that you're able to work with your, your husband in a way that mm -hmm. adds value and you're doing something that you love and it's all based on relationships. And, and certainly what you did in healthcare is a, is a basis for great relationships. And I think, you know, when I, when I hear the title and probably when other people hear the title, director of client relations, you would have to be a, an excellent relationship builder. Trisha, what do you think are the most important characteristics of you know, someone in your role and, and what you've sort of done over the years to build great relationships? So my role at Northwestern Mutual is a little bit of an unusual role. Um, what, what I primarily do is I work with our current clients to fully establish the relationships. I get to know them very personally and very intimately, and learn more about them, not just the numbers on a piece of paper, but who are they? I spend a lot of time talking to them about what charities they support, what passions they have, and what relationships are important to them in their world. So we can help customize their financial plan to really serve their needs to the best, best ability that we can. See, that's really interesting because you just said you focus on the relationships that they have. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's yes. all about them. Uh, it's not numbers, regardless of what the company is and what the company mm -hmm. does. It's not about the numbers. And I think there's a genuineness and a human that you would have to bring to the table in order for people to have that trust in you. Yes, um, I think my donor background, my donor relations background helps with that because it's the same process. It's really finding out what the client needs and then meeting them where they are. We're not all the same. And you can put on a piece of paper the demographics. If Deidre, you and I might be the same age, gender, ethnicity, marital status. We, we might look the same on paper, but we're very different people. And we know that contextually, bringing that into the financial planning process, I think, is what makes our team better at what we do. Much, much better. That's really good. And I'm sure, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're working with people, they have challenges that they need or, or they're, they're nervous about their financial planning. There has to be some kind of level of comfort that you bring as well. Absolutely. I think most people feel a little bit like they're opening their underwear drawer when they come yeah. and talk to their financial planner, <laughs> right. right? Because there's no hiding no. what you've done. And, and most of us have made a few boo-boos along the way. Sure. Maybe we didn't invest properly or save enough or we're self-conscious. Um, the biggest uh, comment that prospects will say to us is, I don't have much. And that's a subjective term because what sure. is not much to me might not be much to you know, Bill Gates or someone else. Right. It's, it's all relative. And we, don't, we actually don't look at a person's net worth or a person's availability to invest when it comes to dollars when we choose who we work with. I probably should, should mention that, actually. One of the other differentiating facts for our team, and, and the team I work for is Small World Wealth Management at Northwestern Mutual, is that we only work with people that we like, uh -huh. that are engaged, <laughs> that are interested in the process and the program. And the reason is, if, if someone is combative or difficult or not uh, disclosing everything um, or just frankly, you know, not fun to be around, then there's no reason to work with them. We're not the right advisory team for them. There's plenty of others out there. Absolutely. It sounds like you work with people like you. <laughs> right? I think that that's, that's very true. That's very true. We've all gone, gone through some of those personality tests. I'm sure you've done it. And, mm -hmm. and on our team, we've done some of them. Um, Joe, my, my partner, and I uh, come up very close in personality, which sometimes annoys the rest of our team members because <laughs> I think they'd rather have a little... <laughs> two feet in a pod. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, it is, it's helpful to have a very similar uh, feeling, a very similar way of carrying yourself. Um, and then to answer a little bit more, something else, something else you asked me about, 
building a relationship begins with the seed of curiosity. I am innately curious. And so when I meet you, I want to I want to learn about you. I want to I want to find what your uh, ledger is. You know, every map has a ledger. It tells you how much distance is between this and this and north and south and every right. person I think has that too. And so I really do try to spend some time on the ledger so I can see what's important to you as an individual. I'm so glad you pointed that out. Uh, curiosity, first of all, is a quality, is a really good quality for any leader. And apply that to the relationship. That's, a, you know, a, a, an ingredient in the secret sauce. Because if you are curious about somebody, if you genuinely want to understand and just to know what makes them tick, that, mm -hmm. that opens up people. And people, I find, like to share. That if you're Absolutely. interested and curious, they will share even more. So it's very interesting. I, I have a little business book club I belong to, and we recently read uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Remember that book? Yeah. It's a, you know, it's a dinosaur book. Yeah, and I do remember when that. The, a long time. Yeah, when the person suggested it, I was really kind of annoyed because I thought, I read that in college. Right. I don't want to read that again. Um, not only did I read it, but Joe and I listened to it on the audio book while traveling three times because there was so much good content in there that, that was wonderful reminders. And a lot of it had to do with relationship building. And the one key takeaway that Dale talks about that I think is vital to building relationships is to always make sure the person you're with feels like they're the most important person to you for those moments. That's powerful. That is really powerful. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. almost like I, uh, first of all, I have to go back and read that book. Reread it. Something tells me when you're reading it in school and you're younger, you're going to have a different take than after years and years of experience in business. Mm -hmm. um, what you said about, you know, that being the only person that matters in that moment. Mm -hmm. I used to love when um, I owned an agency for a while and mm -hmm. some of our larger clients would say, are we your only client? And yeah. that's the best feeling in the world yeah. because you make somebody feel like they are the only one that matters mm -hmm. <laughs> in that moment. Mm -hmm. And Trisha, Absolutely. do you think that's hard to do today with I don't know, um, everybody's running around, there's so much noise and chatter. Mm -hmm. I often wonder if people are really present enough to make mm -hmm. somebody matter in the moment. Do you mm -hmm. think it's harder today? Uh, it's both harder and easier, actually. Because there's so much uh, noise and static in the background, if you shut it off and give someone some attention, they feel it. They feel it more intensely. So some of the things that, that I know that I try to do, and I think we try to do it as a team, is shut the cell phone off when yeah. you're with a client. Mm -hmm. It sounds silly, but a lot of people don't do it. Um, look people in the eyes. You know, the real basics, touch someone. When did we become afraid to touch someone? Yeah. It's very powerful to put your hand on someone or to really give them an embrace and really look at them in the eye and just a few seconds makes them feel um, incredible. Yeah. I mean, the, the eye contact, um, when you're in the room with somebody, your body language says a lot. Mm -hmm. Are you leaning into the conversation? There's nothing that replaces a hug, hello, mm -hmm. or goodbye, yeah. a handshake. And when I think of this, you know, we, we talk about an age of automation and artificial intelligence and mm -hmm. being replaced. All of that can't be replaced. Real right. relationships cannot be replaced. And, mm -hmm. you know, I find comfort <laughs> in knowing yeah. this, you know. That and then, go ahead. you know, if I can tell you a quick story, and I, I do some speaking in the nonprofit world on stewardship and donor relations. I still continue to do that as a volunteer. 
And I, I tell this story repeatedly, but I think it might be worth sharing. Years ago, I attended a luncheon as um, a donor. You know, it was for a nonprofit. I bought a ticket. I bought a handbag. I think I paid $20 for the raffle and I went on my way. Um, the next week or two, I received a voicemail from the executive director of that nonprofit thanking me for coming for my handbag purchase, my $20 raffle ticket purchase, and inviting me to come back again next year. And I thought, when is the last time I received a phone call, a phone call from someone thanking me? I called her right away and I said, I'm nothing special. I'm not the top donor. I'm not on the committee. I, you know, why did you call me? And she said, she called every single attendee, 450 attendees to thank them. Oh, I'm getting chills. Because even if they only made a small contribution, they attended, they participated, they supported, and she wanted them to feel the appreciation. That blew me away. That blows me away. Because yeah. it meant that much to yes. somebody. 450 calls. That is unique. Yeah. And age. we can hide behind email and texting and electronics. Right. You know, talking to somebody like we're doing right now, talking on the phone, face to face. You know, it just is incredibly different than a text or an email. Absolutely. Some, sometimes mm -hmm. people are shocked when I pick up the phone yes. and actually call them because, you yes. know, I guess we're all so used to email and text. Now, mm -hmm. Trisha, I'm, I'm going to ask you to hold your thoughts just for a moment. Okay. We're going to shift our focus over to leadership and emotional intelligence because as you may know, I've embarked on this millennial passion project. Um, I've been doing research for the past year, and the millennials that I've interviewed have helped to build a model called FEEL. Face your fears, mm -hmm. engage with empathy, use ethics mm -hmm. and good judgment, and unleash the love. And before I share with the women worldwide audience where they can all go to take a test to see how much they mm -hmm. feel, I just want to ask you, how are you bringing emotional intelligence into the workplace with the mm -hmm. people that you're working with? I think that's an easy answer, but hard to implement. And the answer for me is to not be afraid to be vulnerable. I think that if you, if you take away, take your coat off and show your colleagues and your clients that you're you're vulnerable, you're, you're very human and very raw, you will connect with them in ways that um, you can, almost can't break that bond in the future. That's a really great point. And mm -hmm. as you, I use it as peel back some of the layers of the onion or mm -hmm. take off your coat, you actually have to do that first. I think yeah. that younger generations, um, so millennials and Gen Z coming into the workforce, they're not going to open up first. It mm -hmm. takes somebody else. It takes a, a supervisor, a manager, a leader to actually mm -hmm. be a little bit vulnerable to create that safe space for them mm -hmm. to share as well. So thank you. Thank you for that important answer. And everybody, you can now take a test. Um, if you go to feelfirsttest.com, you can take a test that scores you, evaluates you in all areas of feel. So your fears, your empathy, your ethics, and your love or your passion that you bring to the table. And once you're scored, the test recommends exercises for you to do so you can increase feel. And the whole reason is so that you can actually build these real relationships. So thank you, Tricia, for answering. And thanks, everybody. I hope you go take the test and let me know. Remember, feelfirsttest.com, how you do. Okay, let's dive back into our discussion. So Tricia, when I open up the show, I mentioned the highs and the lows <laughs> of the yeah. experts and the guests and you know for all of your success from whether you were in the healthcare and donor relations and philanthropy to what you're doing now with your team you face challenges and absolutely if you would maybe you could either share 
an uh oh moment, um, a learning experience, and then of course share some of the success <laughs> as well. Sure. Well, there are many, many uh oh moments. I think, um, and you know, I I practice yoga. I don't know if you do yoga, Deidre, but in I yoga, mm -hmm. if you're not falling out of the pose, you haven't really pushed yourself and done it right. And so I try to think about that when I screw it up <laughs> at work, that I'm just doing my asana, I'm falling out of the pose, but it certainly happens more than I would like. I think that um, the biggest challenge for me has to do with supervising staff and um, having our culture as the leaders of our team permeate through to all of the staff. Um, and I'll and I'll share a kind of a recent story where we are going through the end of the year reviews, like many 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 people are who supervise staff. And one of the team members said he felt that we should do more team building activities. He felt that there was some fragmentation, and so we asked him for some suggestions, and he had some ideas. And um, we thought, Let, we're going to do this because we're going to empower this this younger person in our team. And so I started to survey the other members of the team to see what they thought, if they liked it, you know, when we could do it. Uh, nobody wants to do it. Interesting. And yeah, and it's, it's really disappointing. Um, so I, I went back and I did an anonymous uh, study to try to figure out what they don't want to do, because I think we have this phenomenal team. And I found out that they just didn't want to give up uh, after hours time yeah. for something they felt was work related. And, I, and I'm going to tell you the truth. I was a little annoyed by that. Yeah. I thought, we pay annoyed, you well. Disappointed. Yep. Yeah. You know, we provide this great work environment. We pay you well. We do all of these things. We want you to meet us you know, part way in a sense. So you might look at it like, Hey guys, we're a family. We can do things mm -hmm. after hours. Yeah. And I was a little hurt. You know, I, sometimes I, sometimes part of that being vulnerable mm -hmm. means being hurt. Right. And you so I was a little hurt. Right. Um, and then I had to take a step back and really think about it and remember that we all come from different places. And we all have different needs. And as a, a founder or a leader in the business, we may have different motivations and different investment than a, t a paid staff person. And, and that that was okay, that it's okay. So, so we shifted the event and we're going to do it during the work day. Okay. And now they're enthusiastic and I'm <laughs> hoping we'll get out of it what we wanted to. I think you would. You know, I would be, yeah. I mean, I think that, um, People who put themselves out there can sometimes be hurt, and maybe that's okay. Yeah, and look at the yeah. compromise. So it's not that you know you yeah. abandon the the team building. I'm sure everybody now feels really um, motivated to be together. The person who suggested it probably feels great because everybody's on mm -hmm. board. And you, as a leader, can step back and see all the great results that comes out. I hope so. But I'm going to tell you, I walked around the office stomping my feet for a couple of days. I mean, I was really I love your honesty, about though. it. <laughs> Seriously, that, you know, yeah. you're, you're transparent. And when you yeah. have relationships, whether it's the clients you serve or it's the mm -hmm. people that you're working with, you can't pretend who you are and how you feel. So maybe it right. was better you, you know, you were stomping your feet a bit until you got to the compromise. <laughs> I have no poker face. I'm told that all the time. <laughs> I know. I, I, I can relate with you there, Tricia. Sometimes yeah. it's worn right on my sleeve. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. But then again, mm -hmm. that's, that's feel. And we need more feel in yeah. the workplace. Mm -hmm. That takes time. And it does, it does take trust. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any um, learning experiences that maybe you can share where, um, I don't know, that you, that happened to you that um, you kind of 
tackle the challenge, move something forward, something that maybe you learned in your career over in healthcare that you brought over into mm -hmm. financial services? So, you know, related, going back to the relationship building, if I can, I'll share with you a story. When I was um, very early in my career, and I had, I don't know how many children I had at the time, but I have a whole handful of children. And I had, um, one of them was a baby, and there were a whole bunch of others. And You're more had, a Brady Bunch, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's nutty. It's super nutty in my yes. house. It's crazy. But um, there were a bunch of young kids at home, and I had a, a nanny, and there was a childcare emergency, as probably lots of moms and dads have faced. And um, I had to make alternate arrangements, and I was running around, and I, I figured out a, what I thought was a good temporary solution, which would make me 30 minutes late for work officially for a two-week period of time. I felt very proud about figuring it out. And I, yeah. I went into my boss at the time, who was also a working mom and shared with her that I had figured it out. And I was very proud. And she looked at me stone faced and said, that's not going to work. Mm. And I thought, what? And she said, you need to be here at whatever time, eight o'clock or whatever time it was. And I backpedaled and I said, well, I'll, I can stay half hour later. I can work through lunch. I can, you know, and, and she said, no, you need to figure it out. Hmm. So, um, and it, it, was an, it was expensive and difficult to figure out a solution. I figured it out. Fast forward, probably 10 or more years later, when I was supervising a team of my own, uh, some of whom were young, young women. One of them, my director of marketing at the time at a hospital, um, had her first baby. And she lived a few miles from the hospital and she was really struggling with uh, breastfeeding and some other things. And she came to me in tears when she came back, it wasn't going to work. She couldn't figure it out. And I remembered the stoicism and the coldness of that previous supervisor, how she handled my situation. And I, I said, I'm going to make a difference for this person. Oh, we're so going to figure out, we're going to figure it out. And we came up with a solution where she came to work in the mornings and she went home from, I don't know, 12 to two and she was with her child. And then she came back when her husband got home and she is still there at that hospital. She, her loyalty to me and to her employer was tenfold. She would do anything we needed because we met her where she needed to be. And so that was a really key learning experience for me as a young professional. Oh, that is such a good story. Things yeah. that happen to us to want to do something better. I mean, mm -hmm. have that kind of contrast to know. And, and people say, oh, why do, why do these things happen? It's so that you learn. It's so that when it happens to you, you can do something better for mm -hmm. somebody else. And that's exactly what you did. And what a difference you made for that young woman in her career. And yeah. as a young mom, and you know, and I know, that's a really, it's a, it can be a challenging time because mm -hmm. you're, it's all new and you want to make it all work. And when somebody opens up and says, I'm going to help you make it work, well, that just screams relationship and yeah. loyalty. Yeah, long-term, have a long-term vision. That's exactly. important. So mm -hmm. I have to ask you the, the stress question uh, before I get yeah. to the advice question. Um, <laughs> stress, you know, do you have stress? You might have had it when you're younger. Do you have it now? How do you handle it? Yes, yes, and yes. I mean, I think that um, you're not working hard if you don't have stress. And um, stress comes in so many different forms. Uh, I think I mentioned to you earlier, I, we have eight children between the two of us combined <laughs> houses and <laughs> three dogs, a cat and, you know, a company and, and all kinds of things going on. So yes, yes, yes. There's a lot of stress. Um, I try to manage it through, uh, I sleep and I exercise. Those are really important things for me and not because I want to have a swimsuit model body, but because I sleep want to important. feel well, you know, <laughs> I, and, and I exercise, you can't exercise if you don't sleep. <laughs> no, the whole thing is important. And, you know, a lot of people give lip service to wellness, 
But I really do believe that if you treat your body with reverence and respect and you do it well, it will give back to you. And, and it'll give back to you in brain power and physical stamina and in managing stress. So I try to do that. I, I also will uh, revert to chocolate and wine when that doesn't work. <laughs> They're both so yummy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> exactly. I do yeah. believe you, you have to take care of yourself first in mm -hmm. order to be good to yourself and you can be better for others and be there mm -hmm. for others. That's really important. And on the note of sleep, and I know I've said this before, mm -hmm. so all of you women worldwide listeners, you entrepreneurs out there who are proud of getting four hours of sleep a night, no good. that's like being drunk during mm -hmm. the day. Literally, mm -hmm. if you're only getting four hours of sleep, you it's almost equivalent to having eight beers and trying mm -hmm. to drive a car. You wouldn't do it. So you're, you're better off the six to eight, whatever many hours you need. That amount of sleep allows you to then focus. You can exercise. You can you know, go about your day and just feel so much better and help people. So mm -hmm. Tricia, question. Yeah. Uh, I always like to round out this, the entire segment with a little advice from you. What mm -hmm. can you share with other professionals? I know we talked a lot about relationships. We discussed mm -hmm. emotional intelligence, the challenges, but any parting advice to all of the Women Worldwide listeners about how they can do better with their relationships? Um, so this is specific for women, I think. Richard Branson has a quote that I love, and I'm not going to try to quote him, but this is in essence what he says. He talks about how men will take on new challenges that are unknown to them, that someone dangles a little something in front of them, and they jump in, and they're not afraid to try it. And women tend to think they have to master that skill that um, knowledge, that education before they'll move on to the next thing. And so my advice is to remember the idea of a career is not a ladder. It really is a jungle gym. It has, you know, ladders and slides and monkey bars. And don't be afraid. Just don't be afraid to try something new. You, you can always do something else. It doesn't have to be so rigid. I think that's my, my advice. That's great advice. I love the jungle gym. I know. Right. There's all different things that you're going to get your hands on and embrace mm -hmm. and try mm -hmm. it. Go, go for it. Last question, mm -hmm. super easy. Where can people find out more about you and your work? Sure. So our website is smallworldwealthmanagement.com or you can reach me at trisha.omalley at nm.com. Awesome. Trisha, thank you so much for coming on the show for sharing your journey, your everything that you've learned, giving really good advice. We so appreciate you. It was a real honor. I really do appreciate it. I hope you have a wonderful day. Yes, you too. And I want to thank all of you for tuning into Women Worldwide. Keep the feedback coming. We love it. You know, you can tweet to us and you can tweet to me. I'm at Dee Breckenridge. And be sure to sign up or subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's the Deirdre Breckenridge channel so you can see our guests. Of course, you can always listen to the podcast as well. Okay, friends, until our next episode, Stay focused, energized, and feeling empowered. Thank you.